It's hard to believe that this gigantic steel structure, often towering several stories above ground level, is really nothing more than an elaborate device for boiling water and producing steam. Equally interesting is the fact that the boilers in your plant, which burn huge quantities of fuel, withstand thousands of pounds of pressure, and operate at extremely high temperatures, are really some of the most delicate pieces of equipment in the powerhouse. When operated properly, a boiler is a marvel at efficiently converting tremendous volumes of water into even greater volumes of superheated steam. The steam, in turn, is used to drive large turbine generators capable of producing the power necessary to keep a plant's customers supplied with electricity. By the same token, when operated improperly, a boiler can quickly transform into a monster that wastes resources and endangers the lives of plant personnel. The task of keeping a boiler under control falls to the plant operator, who must understand how boilers work and the proper procedures for keeping them operating safely and efficiently. Boilers are one of the most important components in the plant cycle, for it is inside these enormous structures that a process is set into motion that provides a continuous flow and transformation of energy that results in the generation of electricity. In this topic, we'll take a close look at boilers and boiler operation. We'll begin with a general discussion of how boilers work and the types of boilers typically used by the power industry. In later units, we'll cover the basic procedures for boiler startup, shutdown, normal operation, and the operator's responsibilities for efficient and safe operation. Finally, we'll look at some of the abnormal or emergency conditions that you may encounter on the job, the steps you should take to minimize the chances of them occurring, and what to do if they occur. One thing that you need to keep in mind as you progress through this topic on boilers is that we can't teach you everything you'll need to know about operating the boilers in your plant. That knowledge can only come from experience and on-the-job training. What we can teach you about is how the most common types of boilers used by the power industry work and some basic procedures for operating them safely and efficiently. Your instructor can help you apply this information to the boilers that you will be operating. Now, there are many types of boilers in use today, and in order to discuss them properly, we need a working definition of the term boiler. For our purposes, we'll define boiler as a component in the plant cycle that consists of a closed vessel which uses the heat produced by the combustion of fuel to efficiently transform water into steam. Another name often applied to boilers is steam generator, because the function of the boiler is to generate steam. Now, one important aspect of all power plant boilers is that they must be efficient, because efficiency is essential to boiler operation. It has a direct bearing on how much electricity can be produced and how much it costs to produce that electricity. Efficiency is also important because it is in part responsible for the evolution of the modern power plant boiler. Now, this simplified diagram will help to illustrate that evolution. The first boilers weren't much more complicated than this drawing of an open water-filled container, heated by the combustion of fuel. If the water in the container is heated long enough, it boils and produces steam. Now, while this method does produce steam, there are a number of inefficiencies built into its design. First, the open container only produces steam at atmospheric pressure. By increasing pressure, it's possible to produce steam with a greater energy content capable of doing more work. An open container also limits the ability of the operator to control the flow of steam. Later designs closed the container to produce steam at a higher pressure, capable of doing more work. Piping and valves were also added to control the flow of steam to the turbine generator. A second problem with these early designs had to do with the water level in the container. Once the boiling process started, the container could rapidly boil dry. This caused the container to overheat and interrupted the supply of steam to the turbine generator. 
These problems were solved by adding feed water lines, which supply the container with a constant flow of feed water for the continuous production of steam. The constant flow of feed water and steam also removed heat from the container, keeping it from overheating. The final problem in some early boiler designs that we'll look at concerns a loss of heat. With the system we've illustrated, much of the heat produced by the combustion of fuel does not go towards the production of steam. Instead, this heat is lost to the surrounding atmosphere. The solution to this problem requires that the water-filled container and the heat source be enclosed in a boiler casing. The casing insulates the boiler and keeps the majority of the heat of combustion inside the boiler casing where it can do the most work. The addition of a boiler casing, however, created some other problems for the early operators. The casing reduced the air supply for the combustion of fuel and made it difficult to maintain a flame in the boiler. To remedy this situation, fans were added to provide the air required for combustion. In some cases, only one fan was used. This fan is generally called a forced draft, or FD, fan because it forces air through the boiler, keeping the pressure in the furnace above atmospheric pressure. In other designs, a second fan, generally called an induced draft, or ID fan, was added. This fan pulls air and combustion gases through the system and keeps the furnace under a slight negative pressure. The system is often called a balanced draft system. By adding these and other components to improve the efficiency of the boiler, we have the beginnings of a modern boiler, such as the ones now used in power plants. The modern boiler design now consists of three basic systems. The steam water circuit, where water is introduced into the boiler and converted to steam. The furnace where fuel and air are combined to produce the heat needed to boil water, and the air-gas circuit, which is the path that the hot gas takes as it passes through the boiler, generally aided by one or more fans. Further innovations produce the two basic types of boilers in use today. These are drum-type boilers, in which part of the water continually recirculates through the steam water circuit and once through boilers, which convert water to steam in one pass through the circuit. In a little while, we'll take a look at the systems and components that make up each of these types of boilers. For now, though, read the first segment in your text and answer the questions. And remember to ask your instructor to help you if you're having any trouble with the material. There are a number of different ways of classifying boilers used in power plants. A common method is to classify them by type. I said earlier that there are two basic types of boilers used by the power industry, drum type boilers and once through boilers. Each of these types have distinguishing characteristics that make them unique. One thing that they have in common is a steam water circuit. In this program, we'll look at the components that make up a steam water circuit in a typical drum type boiler. Later on, we'll look at once through type boilers. A drum type boiler depends on the constant recirculation of water through the steam water circuit to generate steam and to keep the components in the circuit from overheating. This simplified diagram illustrates the basic components that make up a typical drum type boiler. Right now, the only components that we'll concentrate on are those that are filled with water. Typical components in a steam water circuit generally include an economizer, a steam drum, downcomers, a lower header, water wall tubes, and an outlet header. For simplicity's sake, our diagram only shows a representation of each of these components. The boilers in your plant, however, are much more complex. We'll look at the job that each of these components performs, beginning with the economizer. An economizer is typically a section or bundle of tubes located in a boiler that receives feed water from the feed water line. The function of an economizer 
is to increase the temperature of the feed water before sending it to the steam drum. Once the feed water reaches the economizer, it's common practice to refer to the water as boiler water. The heat source for the economizer is the hot gas that is produced in the furnace by the combustion of fuel. These gases, commonly called flue gas, contain a great deal of heat. Without an economizer, this heat would be wasted to atmosphere. However, by passing the gas over the economizer tubes, some of the heat is transferred to the water inside the economizer tubes. This process serves three important functions. First, it increases the overall efficiency of the boiler by utilizing heat in the flue gas, which would otherwise be lost up the stack. Secondly, heating the water before it flows to the steam drum helps bring the water temperature closer to saturation temperature and thereby reduces the amount of heat that must be added to the water to get it to boil. Finally, it helps prevent thermal shock to the drum metal. The second component of the steam water circuit that we'll look at is the steam drum. Steam drums can be designed in a number of ways, but their basic function is to hold a large supply of water for the water walls and to separate steam from the water after it's been heated in the boiler furnace. We'll be looking at how this is accomplished later on. Right now, let's go on and cover the downcomers. Downcomers are large vertical pipes that run from the bottom of the steam drum to the lower header or headers. Boiler water from the steam drum flows to the lower headers through the downcomers. Most drum type boilers have two or more downcomers and several lower headers. The lower headers receive boiler water from the downcomers and send it to the water wall tubes that line the inside of the furnace. A lower header is little more than a horizontal pipe that distributes the proper amount of water to each of the vertical tubes that make up the water walls. Water wall tubes are generally arranged side by side and welded together to form continuous walls of tubing inside the boiler. This is usually referred to as membrane construction. Boiler water circulates from the lower header into the water walls. The water flows upward inside the tubes which are exposed to the heat of the boiler flame. Heat transferred from the boiler flame to the water in the tubes causes the water temperature to increase. As heating continues, the water absorbs enough heat to convert part of it into steam. The resulting steam water mixture travels up the water wall tubes to the outlet header. The outlet header directs the steam water mixture to the steam drum where the water and steam are separated. The dry saturated steam is directed on for additional heating and then goes to a turbine while the water is collected in the steam drum and supplied to the downcomer where this entire process is repeated. The circulation of water through the steam water circuit is important for the efficient production of steam. In a little while, we'll look at two methods used to circulate water through a drum type boiler. For now, review the material on the steam water circuit in your text and answer the questions. If you have any questions about this material, ask your instructor to help you before going on. Earlier, I told you that one method of classifying boilers is by type and drum type and once through type boilers are the two most common types in use today. Another method of classifying boilers is by the method used for circulating water through the components in the steam water circuit. We'll look at two methods of circulating water in a drum type boiler, natural circulation and controlled circulation. Now, later, we'll look at circulation in a once through type boiler. In a natural circulation drum type boiler, water circulates through the tubes because of a difference in density between water and steam. In controlled circulation, drum type boilers, pumps, usually called boiler water circulating pumps, circulate water through the steam water circuit. Now we'll look at natural circulation first. Natural circulation refers to the fact that when water is heated, it becomes less dense. 
This means that for a given volume of water, hot water weighs less than cold water, and steam weighs much less than either of them. During normal operation, the heated steam water mixture in the water walls is less dense than the cooler water in the downcomers. The result is the steam water mixture in the water wall is displaced by the heavier and denser water in the downcomers. That is, cooler water from the downcomer is continually pushing the hotter steam water mixture in the water walls through the circuit. This produces a self-sustaining circulation called natural circulation. We can demonstrate natural circulation with this laboratory setup. This container of water will serve as the boiler drum. This tube will represent a downcomer, and this tube will represent a water wall. With the water temperature the same throughout the system, we'll inject some dye and check for flow. Notice that with no difference in temperature, there is no flow through the system. This is the equivalent of a boiler prior to light off. Let's heat the water wall tube and see what happens. In an actual boiler, there is no direct contact between the boiler flame and the water wall tubes. Direct contact could cause the tubes to overheat and rupture. However, for this demonstration, we're using direct contact between the flame and the tube to produce the temperature differential necessary to cause the water to circulate. Now, notice what's beginning to happen. The water where we're applying heat is beginning to boil. And as the water continues to boil, we begin to get a flow through our system. The cooler water in the downcomer is pushing the water up the water wall tube. The dye is moving up the water wall tube, and heated water is overflowing the top of the tube. And by simply heating the tube, we have created a flow through the system. The reason for the flow is the density differential created by adding heat to the water. The water is less dense in the water wall than it is in the downcomer, so the heavier water displaces the lighter water. Natural circulation drum type boilers work in much the same way. Of course, they work on a much larger scale, and the temperatures and volumes of water involved are much greater. Two points you need to understand about natural circulation are, during initial firing, circulation is created in a boiler long before water starts to boil, and the circulation rate is directly proportional to the density differential of the water in the downcomer and the steam water mixture in the water walls. Circulation in a boiler is necessary for two important reasons. First, circulation provides a constant supply of water to be transformed into steam. Second, continuous water circulation carries the intense heat of the boiler furnace away from the water wall tubes. Now, if flow is reduced or circulation stopped, the water wall tubes would overheat and rupture almost immediately. That's exactly what happened to this tube. Density is the key to natural circulation. As long as there is a difference between the density of the water in the downcomer and the water walls, flow will take place. As an operator, you are concerned with the rate of flow through the boiler. Unless the flow rate is sufficient to cool the water wall tubes, They'll overheat, rupture, you'll have a problem on your hands. Therefore, controlling the density of the water in the downcomers and the water in the water wall tubes is an important operator consideration. In general, three factors affect the density of the water in a boiler. They are the amount of heat transferred to the water in the boiler furnace, the height the boiler and the pressure of the boiler. Increasing the temperature in the boiler furnace transfers more heat to the water in the water wall tubes. This means that there is a greater difference between the water in the water walls and the water in the downcomers. The result is an increase in flow through the system and greater protection of the water wall tubes from the heat of the boiler furnace. Now the height of the boiler also increases circulation through the system. 
the taller the boiler, the greater the height of water in the downcomers and water wall tubes. When the water in the water wall tubes is heated, it becomes less dense and therefore lighter. This means that there is a greater difference in weight between the water in the downcomers and the water in the water wall tubes. The result is again an increase in flow through the system because of the weight differential. The third factor that affects density is pressure. As pressure increases, the amount of heat required to bring water to saturation temperature also increases. This means that the difference in density between the water in the downcomers and the water walls decreases because some of the steam produced in the water walls changes back to water when pressure increases. The result is a reduction in flow. And this means that less heat is being carried away from the water wall tubes and the chances of them overheating and rupturing are increased. Each of these factors, heat transfer, the height of the boiler, the operating pressure, are considered in boiler design. As operators, you don't directly affect boiler designs, but you need to understand the effect that these factors have on density and therefore natural circulation so that you don't take any action which could adversely affect circulation. For example, most boiler startup procedures for natural circulation drum type boilers caution the operator to keep the firing rate to a minimum. The reason being, circulation will not take place until enough heat is transferred to the water in the water wall tubes to lower its density. Meanwhile, no heat is being carried away from the water wall tubes. If the firing rate is higher, the tubes will overheat and rupture. Now, this example points out why your plant's operating procedures are so important. Another method of circulating water through a boiler is to add pumps in the downcomer. These pumps are usually called boiler water circulating pumps and are found only on controlled circulation boilers. In this system, water flows from the steam drum down downcomers to a suction header. The boiler water circulating pumps take suction from this header and direct the water to a distribution header or drum. The distribution header then sends the water to the lower header. The advantage of using pumps to provide circulation rather than to rely on natural circulation is that controlled circulation is not affected as much by heat transfer, the height of the boiler, or changes in pressure. Even at maximum pressure, the pump will provide sufficient flow. This means that for the same size boiler, more steam can be produced with controlled circulation boilers than with natural circulation boilers. Regardless of whether the boilers in your plant are natural or controlled circulation, the flow path of water and steam through the steam water circuit remains essentially the same. Take some time now to review the material on natural and controlled circulation in your text and answer the questions. When we return, we'll look at how a typical steam drum separates water from steam and how superheaters are used to add heat to the steam. Remember, if you have any questions about any of the material we've covered so far, ask your instructor to help you before going on. So far, we've followed the flow of water through the steam water circuit where enough heat is added to turn part of it into steam. In this program, we'll show you how the steam and water in the steam drum are separated and follow the flow of steam through the superheater and reheater sections of the boiler. Now, this is what a typical steam drum looks like from the outside. It is a closed drum that runs the entire width of a boiler. Numerous connections coming off of the drum supply water to the downcomers, receive the steam water mixture from the outlet headers, and supply steam to the superheater. We'll use this simplified diagram of a typical steam drum to explain the principles of how it works. Now keep in mind that like boilers, there are any number of steam drum designs. And what we'll show you here is typical of how a steam drum works. Your instructor can help you apply this information to your specific equipment. 
We'll begin by identifying the typical connections coming off of a steam drum. In general, there are four basic connections. This first one supplies boiler water from the economizer to the drum. The supply line is connected to distribution piping inside the steam drum. This piping evenly distributes water throughout the drum. Typically, the water level in a steam drum is maintained between one-third to one-half full during normal operation. The second set of connections are usually spaced at regular intervals along the bottom of the drum. These connections supply water from the drum to the downcomers, which ultimately supply water to the water walls. A third set of connections run along both sides of the steam drum. These connections return the steam water mixture produced in the water walls to the steam drum. The final set of connections that are common to most steam drums are these, coming off the top of the drum. These connections supply dry, saturated steam from the steam drum to the superheaters. In addition to these four connections, you may also find connections for a chemical feed line, drum level measurement columns, and a gauge glass. We'll be looking at these in more detail when we discuss boiler operation. Now that we've identified the various connections on the outside of the drum, let's look at the inside. Inside the steam drum are a number of components for separating water from steam and keeping the steam free of impurities. We'll begin with the drum shroud. The drum shroud runs the entire length of the steam drum and receives the steam water mixture from the outlet headers. The drum shroud is actually an inner wall that directs the steam water mixture downward beneath the water level in the drum. The steam being lighter than the water rises in the drum. Spaced at regular intervals near the bottom of the drum are moisture separators. There are many different ways of designing moisture separators. These use blades to impart a swirling motion to the rising steam. The swirling motion causes water remaining in the steam to be pulled outward by centrifugal force. The water hits the sides of the moisture separators and drains to the bottom of the drum. Near the center of the steam drum and running its entire length just below normal water level is the continuous blowdown piping. Continuous blowdown is a term used to describe water which is discharged from the surface of the water in the boiler drum. You will probably hear it referred to as surface blowdown. Continuous blowdown, or surface blowdown, should be distinguished from bottom blowdown, which comes off the lower drum or lower headers. Bottom blowdown is used to reduce heavy sludge or solids, which may settle in the lower headers. While surface blowdown is used to reduce impurities, like silica, which tends to concentrate near the surface of the water level. Most boiler water contains some impurities. When a portion of the water turns to steam, these impurities remain behind in the recirculating boiler water. If the concentration of impurities gets too great, it can affect the purity of the steam leaving the boiler. It can actually be carried over and deposited on the superheater tubes and turbine components. This could cause the superheater tubes to overheat as well as damage the turbine blades. The continuous blowdown piping removes a small portion of the water from the surface of the water level in the steam drum. The water removed from the drum carries with it the majority of the impurities collected in the boiler water. This reduces their concentration in the steam drum and as a result keeps the superheaters and turbine components clean. The final component in a steam drum that we'll look at are the dryer. Dryers are components that remove water remaining in the steam after it's passed through the moisture separators. Dryers are usually located at the top of most steam drums. The dryers shown in our diagram are chevron or V-shaped dryers. These dryers consist of corrugated metal plates that provide a tortuous path for the steam to flow through. Steam flowing through the tortuous path is forced to continuously change directions. Moisture present in the steam is heavier than the steam and can't change direction as rapidly. The result is that the moisture impacts with the plates 
and is forced to drain back into the drum. Now that we've identified the major components that make up a typical steam drum, let's follow the flow path of the water and steam through the drum. Boiler water is supplied to the steam drum through the feed water inlet connection. The drum supplies water to the downcomers through these outlet pipes at the bottom. Water from the downcomers flows into the lower headers and up the water walls. The boiler flame heats the water in the water walls, causing part of the water to turn to steam. The resulting steam water mixture is returned to the drum through these connections on the side. The steam water mixture enters the drum through the drum shroud. Some of the water drains back into the steam drum while the steam is directed through the moisture separators. The moisture separators that are illustrated on our diagram force the steam through blades. These blades cause the steam to spiral up the inside of the separators. Any moisture in the steam is forced to the outside of the spiral by centrifugal force and drains to the bottom of the steam drum. The steam continues to flow toward the top of the drum where it passes through dryers which provide a tortuous path for the steam to pass through. Moisture remaining in the steam drops out and drains back into the drum as the steam winds through the tortuous path. The dry saturated steam leaves the steam drum through the steam outlet lines and is directed to the superheater section of the boiler. Superheaters increase the temperature of the steam coming from the steam drum so that it can be used to efficiently drive a turbine generator. But before we look at superheaters and similar components called reheaters, we need to review three important concepts about steam and temperature. These concepts are boiling, saturation temperature, and superheat. Now, boiling is the process of converting water into steam. At any given pressure, there is a corresponding temperature at which water boils, the saturation temperature. In general, the higher the pressure, the higher the saturation temperature. Whenever water and steam are present together, the temperature of both will always be the saturation temperature. This means that no matter how much heat is present in the boiler, the temperature of the water and steam in the water walls and steam drum will always be the saturation temperature for their operating pressure of the boiler. Steam temperature can only be raised above its saturation temperature when there is no moisture present in the steam. This is the condition that the steam is in when it leaves the boiler drum. Heat added to dry, saturated steam increases its temperature and is called superheating. From the steam drum, the steam passes through the separate sections of boiler tubing called superheaters. Superheaters are located in the flow path of hot gases that are produced during the combustion process. The hot gases flow over the superheater tubes and transfer heat to the steam, increasing its temperature. Superheating steam is desirable because the hotter the steam, the more work it can do. The difference between the saturation temperature of the steam leaving the drum and the temperature of the steam leaving the superheater is called the degrees of superheat added in the superheater. There are a number of different ways of classifying superheaters. One common method is to classify them as primary and secondary. A primary superheater is the first superheater that steam passes through after it leaves the steam drum. Primary superheaters are usually located in a cooler part of the gas flow path than the secondary superheaters. The reason that the primary superheater is in a cooler section of the boiler is to avoid the problems of thermal shock, which could occur to the superheater tubes when the relatively cool steam coming from the steam drum enters the hot tubing in the superheater. From the primary superheater, steam flows to the secondary superheater which is generally located in a direct line of sight with the boiler flame. This is a much hotter section of the boiler. In many boilers, it is possible to raise the temperature of the steam flowing through the superheaters to a point where the steam is not capable of cooling the tubes. 
the intense heat could damage the superheater tubes unless it can be controlled. To control the temperature of the superheated steam, most boilers use spray attemperators. A spray attemperator, or de-superheater, is basically a device that sprays a fine mist of pure water into the flow path of the superheated steam. When the water comes in contact with the superheated steam, it absorbs heat from the steam and immediately flashes into steam. In doing so, it removes a tremendous amount of heat from the steam, thus lowering its temperature. The temperators are generally located between the primary and secondary superheaters. From the secondary superheaters, the superheated steam usually flows to the high pressure section of a turbine generator, where it gives up some of its energy to drive the turbine rotor. As the steam gives up its energy, it begins to cool and its pressure drops. This is the enthalpy drop that we discussed in plant cycle. In most plants, the steam is sent back to the boiler for reheating after passing through the high pressure section of the turbine. In reality, a reheater can be thought of as a re-superheater because the reheater increases the steam temperature, but the steam pressure continues to decrease due to frictional losses in the reheater piping. Reheating takes place in sections of the boiler called reheaters. Reheaters, like superheaters, are simply bundles of boiler tubes located in the flue gas path of the boiler. Reheaters increase the steam temperature so that it can drive the intermediate and low pressure sections of the turbine generator at maximum efficiency. Reheaters may also have spray attemperators to control the temperature of the steam returned to the turbine. In this way, it's possible to maintain a fairly constant steam temperature at the inlet of the steam turbine and reduce thermal stress to the metal component. In this part of the program on boiler fundamentals, we've looked at three important components on the steam side of the steam water circuit. The steam drum, the superheaters, and the reheaters. Take some time now to read over this material in your text and work the problems. When we return, we'll begin looking at the air and gas circuit of a typical drum type boiler. The steam water circuit that we discussed in the previous segments depends on the combustion of fuel to convert water into steam. In earlier topics, you learned that there are four basic requirements for combustion. Fuel, air, heat, and chemical reaction. Now, when we talk about combustion in a boiler, two additional requirements are necessary if we're going to efficiently operate the unit. These are turbulence and time. Turbulence refers to the movement of air and fuel at the burners that allows for complete mixing. There must also be enough time allowed so that all of the fuel burns completely. A plant's fuel handling system provides the necessary requirement of fuel for combustion in the boiler. The spark or flame from the igniter in the burner port provides the necessary heat to start the chemical reaction. The air requirement and the turbulence are provided by the components in the air and gas circuit. Now, before we look at these components, you need to understand the term air. Now, there are many different air systems used in power plants. When discussing boilers and boiler operation, the terms primary air and secondary air sometimes cause confusion. Primary air refers to the air used to start combustion and transport fuel to the burners. In a coal plant, for example, a primary air fan or an exhauster moves dry pulverized fuel from a pulverizer to the coal burners. In an oil plant, primary air is used to atomize the oil so that it will more readily mix with secondary air and burn. Primary air is insufficient to allow for complete combustion of fuel. 
Therefore, we need a secondary air supply to provide the turbulence and additional air necessary for complete combustion to take place. Secondary air is supplied by the combustion air system. This simplified diagram illustrates some of the components that make up a typical combustion air system. These include a forced draft fan, an air preheater, a wind box surrounding the burner ports, and in some cases, an induced draft fan. Most boilers have at least two of each component. We've shown only one here for the sake of simplicity. The pressure in your boiler furnace will determine whether or not you have an induced draft fan. Some furnaces are pressurized. That is, the furnace operates at pressures above atmospheric pressure. Pressurized furnaces do not have induced draft fans. Other boilers are called balanced draft. And their furnaces operate at pressures slightly below atmospheric pressure. Balanced draft boilers have induced draft fans to maintain the furnace under a slightly negative pressure. For the most part, the flow path of air and gas through a boiler is the same regardless of whether it's pressurized or balanced draft. For our purposes, we'll use a balanced draft boiler to explain this flow path. In our system, a forced draft fan draws atmospheric air at ambient temperature in through its inlet veins. The air is forced through ductwork to an air preheater. Air preheaters can take many different shapes, be designed in many different ways. This preheater consists of a number of metal plates that form a circular drum. A rotating hood and ductwork are positioned over the drum. The hood divides the drum into four pie-shaped sections. As the hood slowly rotates, it covers two adjacent sections while leaving the other two sections uncovered. Hot flue gas from the furnace is forced through the uncovered sections of the drum and transfers heat to the metal plates. Secondary air is forced through the sections of the hood that cover the metal plates. With this arrangement, the hood rotates constantly and directs the secondary air through the metal plates that have been heated by the flue gas. Plates transfer heat to the air, raising its temperature. In this way, the fresh air is heated without getting in direct contact with the flue gases. Another typical air preheater works on the same principle as that we just described, except the metal plates are formed into a circular heating element. In this case, the ductwork is stationary and the heating element rotates. There are two basic reasons why it is important to heat the secondary air supplied to the boiler. First, heated air raises the fuel air mixture nearer to the ignition point. Secondly, by heating the primary and secondary air, we reduce the temperature of the flue gas, which would be wasted if it were to be exhausted up the stack. This would cause thermal pollution, and in the case of a balanced draft boiler, would require special precautions for the ID fans which handle these gases. The alternate heating and cooling of metal elements creates a problem called dew point corrosion. Dew point is the temperature at which condensation occurs. If condensation were allowed to form in the presence of sulfur-laden flue gas, sulfuric acid would be created. To prevent dew point corrosion, some boilers are equipped with an air heater to heat the air entering the air preheaters. These air heaters are usually in the form of a tubular heat exchanger with either steam or heated glycol in the tubes. From the air preheater, the heated air is directed to the wind box that surrounds the burner ports. Here's a simplified drawing of a cross section of a burner port within the wind box. Secondary air enters and pressurizes the wind box and is then directed by air registers into the burner port. The air flows around the burner causing turbulence which mixes the fuel and secondary air. This produces a combustible mixture that is ignited by the flame or spark from the igniter. The burner flame extends into the center of the furnace, transferring most of its radiant heat to the water wall tube 
where it is used in the generation of steam. Burner ports can be arranged in a number of different ways. In some boilers, they are arranged in a series of rows at varying levels on the sides of the boiler. Other boilers have burner ports arranged in rows along the corners of the boiler. In addition to these arrangements, some burners are designed to be tilted. This means that the boiler flame can be positioned on a horizontal plane or above or below the horizontal. Tilting burners allow the operator a means of controlling the position of the flame and therefore the temperature of the superheated steam. The boiler flame heats the water in the water wall tubes, causing a portion of it to transform into steam. The flame also produces gases, which flow through the boiler and out the stack. These gases are collectively called flue gas and contain a great deal of heat. It is important to transfer as much of this heat as possible from the flue gas to the water and steam in order to increase the efficiency of the boiler. To accomplish this, superheaters, reheaters, the economizer, and the air preheaters are positioned in the path of the flue gas. As the gas travels through the boiler, much of the heat in the gas is absorbed in these components. In a pressurized furnace boiler, the flue gas is under a positive pressure as it flows past these components. In a balanced draft boiler that we show here, the induced draft fan places the flue gas path under a slightly negative pressure. The induced draft fan draws the flue gas through the boiler and the air preheater. Here, the hot gas is used to heat the secondary air being supplied for combustion. Once it's through the air preheater, the flue gas is drawn into the induced draft fan and is eventually exhausted to atmosphere up the stack. In many boilers, there may also be fans for recirculating some of the flue gas back through the boiler furnace before exhausting it to atmosphere. Flue gas recirculation is one way of controlling steam temperature. We'll look at how this is done later. It's important that you understand how the air and gas circuit increases the overall efficiency of boiler operation. Without the system that we just described, Cold secondary air would enter the wind box and delayed or incomplete combustion would take place. The resulting gases and unburned fuel produced by the incomplete combustion would then travel through the boiler and out the stack. And in doing so, they would carry with them a great deal of heat, which would go to waste. Your boiler is designed to burn a specific fuel, which, if mixed with the correct amount of air, will release a certain amount of radiant heat needed to generate steam. After that, the flue gases will still contain sufficient convection heat for superheating and reheating the system. By using the hot flue gas to heat superheater tubes, reheater tubes, the economizer, and the secondary air, we can utilize the heat to do work and increase the overall efficiency of the boiler. Take some time now to read over this material in your text and answer the questions. Remember, if you are having any trouble following the material that we've presented, have your instructor help you. Up to this point in the program, we've concentrated on the steam water circuit and the air and gas circuit in a typical drum type boiler. Drum type boilers depend on a continual recirculation of water through the boiler in order to generate steam. This means that for a given volume of water, several passes through the system are necessary in order for all of the water to turn to steam. This is commonly referred to as the circulation ratio. A once through or forced circulation boiler operates differently. In a once through boiler, a given volume of water is completely converted into steam in one pass through the system. No recirculation is necessary because there is no water left to recirculate. In order to understand how this is accomplished, you need to understand the concept of critical conditions. Now, earlier, we said that for any given pressure, there is a corresponding temperature at which water will boil. This temperature is called the saturation temperature, and it remains constant as long as water and steam are present together. 
This means that regardless of the amount of heat added to the steam water mixture, the temperature of the steam will not increase until all of the water has vaporized. The additional heat required to completely transform saturated water into steam is called the latent heat of vaporization. Latent heat of vaporization is the heat that is transferred to the boiler water in order to produce steam. This is heat that cannot be completely recovered and performs no other function than that of completing the transformation process. This relationship, however, only holds true up to a point. That point is called the critical point, which occurs at a temperature of 705 degrees Fahrenheit and a pressure of 3,206 PSIA. At temperatures and pressures above the critical point, there is no distinguishable difference between water and steam. At the critical point, steam and water have the same density. What that means is that it is not necessary to add the latent heat of vaporization to the steam water mixture in order to cause the transformation process. All drum type boilers operate at conditions below the critical point. This means that all drum type boilers have a built in inefficiency because they must repeatedly supply the latent heat of vaporization to the boiler water in order to produce steam. Most once through boilers, on the other hand, operate at supercritical conditions. That is, temperatures and pressures above the critical point. These boilers don't need to use additional heat to convert water to steam because above the critical point, there is no difference between the two. We'll use this simplified diagram of a typical once through boiler to explain how they work. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of difference in this diagram and the one we looked at earlier of a drum type boiler. Typically, the components in a once through boiler include an economizer, a lower header, water wall tubes, and an outlet header, superheaters, and reheaters. The only components that are missing are the downcomers and steam drum. And this points up one of the major differences between a drum type boiler and a once through boiler. A steam drum and downcomers are not required on a once through boiler because the transformation from water to steam occurs in one pass through the boiler. Therefore, there is no need to separate water from steam and there is no need to recirculate water through water walls because there is no water left to recirculate. A second difference between drum type and once through boilers is the need for a startup system. This is due to the fact that once through boilers must be started up somewhat like conventional boilers using a device called a flash tank to take the place of the drum. A flash tank is a closed vessel used to separate steam from water and to supply water to the boiler during startup and the excess water drains to the condenser during the startup phase. Circulation is provided by either circulating water pumps which assure water wall circulation, or the boiler feed pumps must maintain a continuous flow through the water wall tubes. After sufficient heat is transferred to the boiler water to raise the flash tank pressure to a designated value, the turbine can be started up. And then by repositioning valves, the boiler components can be gradually changed over to the once through mode of operation. Now with these differences in mind, let's follow the water and steam flow through a once through boiler in the once through mode of operation. Later in this topic, we'll discuss the operation of the startup system prior to once through operation. Feed water is supplied to the economizer at a pressure in excess of 3,206 PSIA, where its temperature is increased due to the flow of flue gases through the economizer tubes. This is the same setup as with a drum type boiler. The heated feed water then flows directly through piping to the lower header and water wall tubes. The temperature of the water increases steadily as it flows through the water wall tubes. This is also similar to the way a drum type boiler operates. 
The difference is that the water in the water wall tubes is under a much higher pressure in a once through boiler. Typically, this pressure will be around 3,500 PSIA, significantly above the critical point. This high pressure prevents the possibility of boiling in the water wall tubes, for if steam bubbles were allowed to develop, the boiler tubes would not be adequately cooled at high fire. When the temperature of the water exceeds the critical point of 705 degrees Fahrenheit, the water and steam become essentially the same. The area of the boiler tubes where this takes place is called the transition zone. For all intents and purposes, once the feed water has passed through its transition zone, it has become steam. The steam then follows a path similar to that in the drum type boiler. That is, it flows through the superheaters to the high pressure section of the turbine, to the reheaters in the boiler, and back to the intermediate and low pressure turbine sections. Air and gas flow through a once through boiler is essentially the same as with a drum type. The principal advantage of a once through boiler over a drum is efficiency. Since operating conditions in a once through boiler do not require the additional latent heat of vaporization to convert water into steam, once through boilers are more efficient. However, the special operating procedures required to start up a once through unit and the higher cost of building these units have detracted some from their popularity in the industry. Now, the operator in a power plant has very little control over the type of boiler that a plant uses. The only thing that an operator really has control over is the efficient operation of the boiler under a variety of conditions. In this program, we've shown you the steam water circuit and the air and gas circuit in typical examples of drum type and once through boilers. It is essential that you understand these systems and components in order to understand the effect you have on them during boiler operation. Later on, we'll look at some basic procedures for operating the boilers in your plant. For now, read over the material on once through boilers in your text and answer the questions. If you're having any trouble understanding any of the material that we've covered, ask your instructor to help you before going on.